Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you've enjo been enjoying the conference so far. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for joining this uh, career panel discussion organized by the Junior Investigators Committee. Um, I'm Evan Graham, and I'm here with Drs. Heather Duffy, Steve Kapman, Itzadel Namro Redwan, and uh, Daniela Minicana. And today's discussion topic is finding your fit, defining goals, and taking action to achieve long-term success. So I'll be moderating this discussion, and I'll be posing questions to each of our panelists. Uh, so I do have some seed questions for the discussion, but the discussion is intended to provide guidance, but it's also to, to spark sort of further discussion among the young investigators and trainees in our community. So I'd like to encourage the audience members also to pose questions in the questions panel for our panelists here. Um, the questions panel, you will find it's the tab that's right next to the chat box. So not directly in the chat box, but in the tab next to it. And we'll be monitoring the questions that are coming in throughout the session. So uh, depending on the flow of the discussion, we may not be able to get to all the questions, but directly following this session, we will open the virtual chat lounge. And that you can find in the Junior Investigators Forum, and that's where we can continue this discussion. So again, I'd just like to thank you all very much for joining. And um, I'd like to begin the discussion by asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves, um, tell us a little bit about their career path and how they arrived at their current position. So I'll just start uh, with uh, Heather Duffy. If you want to begin, that would be great. Sure. Good morning, everybody. Um, they wanted me to keep this to a minute, so I could either talk really, really fast or I'm going to have to leave some stuff out. Um, but I'm happy to uh, cover it in other places. So I started in a very traditional um, academic pathway. I got a PhD. I got a couple faculty positions. I was faculty at Harvard Medical School. And um, for, re for many reasons, I decided that I really wanted to get more into taking uh, therapeutics from the lab and out into the world to develop. So I went to law school. And I'm here to tell you all the things you can do if you have a law degree with your science degree, which is quite a bit. Um, I then started my own consulting company. And what I do is mostly help small startup biotechs get organized, strategize, develop their assays, and uh, generally figure out the business and law side of the world um, because most scientists, you know, we're not taught anything but science. So they need help in that. Great, that sounds really interesting. Uh, Steve, do you wanna continue? Yeah, sure, thanks, Evan. So my name's Steve Kotman and I <clears throat> first off wanna thank the organizers for inviting me here. Um, and I'm in Seattle, Washington. Actually, I'm on this beautiful island called Bainbridge Island right outside Seattle. So as a career highlight, really ending up here. But um, I started my career similar to most of you in, you know, pursuing academics, getting my PhD, followed by a postdoc in New York City in Toronto with uh, Gordon Keller. I then decided to go into industry where I joined a company called Cellular Dynamics International uh, with Jamie Thompson. Um, that was in Madison, Wisconsin. And then after a few career decisions and a bit of career change, ended up here in Seattle, first at the university to uh, help spin off a program into industry. And then now uh, that's been successful and going out, going well. And so now I'm at uh, Sana Biotechnology as a senior director and looking forward to explaining more of that as we go. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Daniela? Thank you, Evan. It's great to hear what everyone else is all about. Um, so I am currently talking to you from Adelaide, which is in South Australia. Australia, it's 11.30 p.m. over here. Um, so pretty much just like everyone else, I was I had followed my heart with everything, I, I'm starting to realise. And I was absolutely in love with science and research. Um, got my undergrad or, or my uh, bachelor's in biomedical science and did my PhD and postdoctoral work in stem cell research, which I absolutely loved. And about five years ago, I moved from research into academia, which is um, teaching 
to university students teaching um, on anything science related and became an education specialist at the University of Adelaide and now I'm heavily involved in teaching course coordination, um, investigating pedagogies behind learning and teaching and, and we're currently building a new bespoke medical program and I'm a huge part of that. So I'm looking forward to telling you all about that transition. Really, really cool. It's nice to see someone who is still in academia, but in a different form of that. Um, yeah. Uh, it's a yes, first of all, I also want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, beautiful panel. Uh, Daniela mentioned following the heart, and I guess uh, that it will be the topic of the day. Uh, I can start with telling you a little bit about my career and uh, the career choices I've made. I actually have a PhD in medicinal chemistry. Um, and during my PhD, I realized that I was missing out on what happened beyond synthesizing these drugs. So I decided to um, execute a postdoc in a stem cell biology lab. So basically I had barely touched any cells, but I decided to synthesize my molecules and then test them uh, it, on, a, on, on stem cell differentiation. And I end up, ended up uh, as a postdoc at the Gladstone Institute's uh, next door to ya Professor Yamanaka. Uh, and I was uh, there for a few years, uh, came back to Sweden, uh, started a faculty position as an uh, uh, assistant professor. Uh, and one day I went together with a colleague of mine to visit this very cool company called Selink, uh, who offered bioprinters to fabricate tissue models and disease models, but also in the long run to print uh, tissues for um, regenerative medicine purposes. And during that visit, uh, you know, I realized also that there is so much more to learn and so much more uh, that I could do. Uh, and the next day after that visit, uh, a recruiter called me and she wouldn't hang up until I had signed. So I left academia and went to industry and I've been with Selling for three years and I've um, actually started their R&D uh, and applications team uh, from non-existing and um, we're still going. Great, that's really, really awesome. I think all of your stories are so inspiring and I like that they're so diverse. I really enjoy hearing that there's so much more that you can do with your PhD than just become a professor. And I don't mean uh, to say just become a professor, but I do like the fact that there's so many, There, it's it really is a wide range of, of uh, opportunities out there for people that have a PhD. So along the way, I think all of you talked a little bit about moving through the uh, through your career. So I just want to ask you a question. Um, I guess this is really directed to all of you. If the choices that you've made have been informed by your career or vice versa, have you um, have the things that you done been been them because of successes in your career or failures in your career? Or have you have you have those choices um, led to certain things? Um, what do you, what do you, what do you say? Heather, if you, you can begin again, I guess. Uh, sure. Uh, hopefully it's not loud other than hearing my voice. Um, if it is, I can move. Um, no, it's so not. there are it's a lot fine. of choices that I made. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of choices that I made due to external things, but most of it was, was internal pivots based on, you know, what I really felt I wanted to do. And I still teach. Um, I teach at Northeastern, um, but I teach a course now on biotech instead of on straight science. And that's great fun. Um, so I've, I've stayed sort of in academia at some level as well. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with how much I, I like teaching and helping other people get through their process. And so that's really my grounding principle in consulting and in teaching. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. So from a teacher's perspective, Daniela, what do you, how do you think that your, um, your career path has been shaped by the things that you've already done versus the things that you, your goals that you've set for yourself? 
That's a great question. Um, I just like to just also to point out that um, I think that I, I realized very early on, even through my studies, that I am a workaholic and that I'm not going to have a work life balance that everyone else seems to, 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 to talk about. And I realized that um, the reason why that is so is because I'm so passionate and in love with either with what I'm studying or what, what I'm working on. So I wasn't focused on a career path. I truly realized that I had to follow my passion and my heart. And being a researcher is that curiosity that I guess led us into that lab to figure out something that hasn't been figured out before. And from there on, I, it was serendipitous that I gave one lecture and realized that talking to 300 students that, whose minds were ready to be blown by little bits of information that, that I already knew, I realized that that is where I wanted to shift my focus because, and selfishly, it's because of the immediate reward that you got through seeing someone learn in front of you the magic of science that we we know a tiny little bit about. So mm -hmm. I just I just followed that. I think that thing that got me into doing biomedical science and the, the, it all it all came from my love for stem cells and everything throughout my my research career where I now, and I still do some research, but where I now found a niche in teaching that just lets me, I don't know, just lets me be everything that I want to be right now. And also just the comfort and growth of knowing that in five years, that may be somewhere completely different. And just being excited about wherever my heart and this knowledge that I've been sort of collecting over time takes me. So keep an open mind is what I'd like to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that that's really, really interesting. I've, I, so I've, I've been involved with uh, a, a few other discussions during the, this conference. And um, one of the themes that I've come up a, across um, in those discussions has been sort of a passion um, for, for science, a passion for, for life, a passion for whatever you want to do. And so I wonder, um, I wonder if Steve, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, how your passion for science or a passion for what you're doing, how that led to the goals that you've created and how you use that passion to propel you towards success. Oh, interesting question. Thanks for that. Um, I, I would say like similar to everybody on the panel that I'm hearing so far, you know, the, that that passion just leads you to the next step. And you, for me, I didn't know what that might be around the next corner, right? Like, so for example, when I, even just going into my PhD, so I, I completed my PhD in immunology in, in uh, Nas National Jewish Medical Research Center in Denver. <clears throat> and then stepping into that, I didn't, you know, probably a year before then, I didn't really know that I wanted to study immunology, but then just found it captivating and so just want to pursue more knowledge with it so went to graduate school there then the next step was going uh, to work on pluripotent stem cells with gordon keller in in new york city and it was kind of the same step where you just i found what he was working on and what that group was working on at the time just captivating as to what they were doing so during the especially during those early career steps it was really just following the passion of science and i didn't always know what it was going to look like around the next corner mm -hmm. and then after finishing my postdoc there were a number of different academic opportunities for sure but i you know i i was suddenly became tuned into this company that was starting up in madison wisconsin cellular dynamics uh, with with jamie thompson as a founder and it you know they were trying to take what we were doing in the academic laboratories using pluripotent stem cells and developing these different tissues and then put it to the test and see if we can actually develop these cells as model systems to study, study drug toxicity toxicity for example and so i it became interesting okay if we study all this in the laboratory can we then put it to the test in actual industry and, and kind of fulfill those things that we've always talked about doing in all of our grants and, and publications along the way. And so, and then, 
once again, you know, it was a similar step coming to Seattle here and do the same thing. So I think it, you know, that, that passion for science just leads you to what's interesting over the next horizon. And I can't say I always know what that's going to look like from one step to the next, you know, you just, you do your best with what you have in front of you and then kind of follow your heart as you're going along. Yeah, I think that that's, I think that that's really, I mean, that's, that's sort of been my sort of philosophy following, you know, my heart, try to figure out what it is that I want to do um, moving through my career as a, you know, relatively young person. Um, I wonder though, there have been, I mean, everybody's taken so many different steps and I wonder, I mean, it's great to follow your heart. It's great to, to, um, to, uh, I don't know, try to, you know, do the best that you want to do and do everything that you want to do, but there are also a lot of risks involved. So I wonder, Itadal, can you talk a little bit about some of uh, navigating those risks that are involved in taking those different steps, moving to that different country, moving, um, moving completely different areas. You said you mentioned you were studying medicinal chemistry and then you went completely to stem cells. How was that, how was that jump? How did you motivate that jump? Um, I think um, I've always had a passion for learning and I can never learn enough. And I think that is what keeps me even going today. Uh, the continuous uh, you know, strive towards learning more and learning new things and developing scientifically, but also as a person. Um, so of course there are risks uh, with moving from one country to another to, to learn something entirely different. But if you're passionate about it, then of course you think this is something that's gonna fulfill you personally, but also maybe career-wise, uh, you know, the, it, the, it doesn't, become too difficult to make that choice. Of course, it's mm -hmm. difficult if you have a family, uh, but um, at that point, even my family went with me. Uh, they moved from Sweden to San Francisco uh, and lived with me for two years during uh, the postdoc. But for them, that was a challenge as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Career-wise, a risk, uh, I think, if you learn more, that does not mean that you put the previous knowledge you've had on a shelf and then you forget about it. It's still there and you can still bring it up and combine it. And I think the combination of, you know, the knowledge that I've learned through, you know, traditional chemistry, stem cell biology, and now bioprinting and biomaterials, that gives me a very interdisciplinary base um, mm -hmm. that, you know, puts me in a position where you can actually communicate with all of the different disciplines and people within those disciplines. And so I don't think you uh, lose uh, one uh, experience because you learn a second one. I think that that's true. I think that, that you definitely, having more experiences is, in my experience has always been really, really helpful. But sometimes um, those experiences don't, don't pan out. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, so how, how do you, I guess this is sort of more of a general question to all of you. How do you navigate, um, this idea of failure? What does that mean? Is that just a, a, a lower level of success or is it, um, I mean, the, the, the word failure when I was growing up, that was sort of like taboo. You don't say, you know, you, we don't want to fail, you know? So what do you, I saw you raise your hand if you want to comment on that. What do you think about that idea? I think when it comes to your career, um, I mean, there is no such thing as a failure. Uh, there is a learning experience. Whatever you go through, I hope you learn a lesson or you learn from the experience or you learn from the move you made. And um, whether you're happy with the move or unhappy let's talk about failure again i mean it's a learning experience and you're never gonna repeat that mistake again and uh, mm. you, you mentioned that you i think daniela you also said that you mentioned that you you indicated that you also wanted to comment yeah. so go ahead i do and um what is currently what we currently label as failure i now um get really really mm. excited about so <laughs> i have 
Um, I have grown. I, I think the moment I see a challenge, uh, I run to it because it's an indicator of so many things happening within us that we generally try to distract away from because we like the comfort and the safe, but eventually that catches up with us. So when something's uncomfortable or when you're not getting to where you think you want to be, I really turn to that and go, what is this message? What am I really telling myself here? So if I wake up in the morning and I'm not look, looking forward to going to work and if that's a regular ongoing occurrence, that is your opportunity to rethink reset, leave, go, travel places, because um, I've done all of this. And especially if I could tell myself something to 10 years ago, it would be grab those, grab onto those failures. They're your best lesson. They're going to get you to a place where you never thought possible. Mm -hmm. Heather, go ahead. So I have both a scientific and then a, a, a personal story about this. You know, when I was working, um, as a graduate student, I used a particular protein for my astrocytes that was a negative control, always, always, always. That was our classic. And I just couldn't get it to work because every time I treated the cells, that protein would show up. Well, you know, that was so-called failure, which turned into a lot of grant money in the start of my research career, because it turns out I found a new upregulated protein in astrocytes when treated with an inflammatory cytokine, right? So if you take that into your life, you look at yourself and you go, well, you know, I thought I was heading somewhere and I had a good control set going on, but um, something keeps popping up. And if that one thing, I think Danielle's story is perfect. You know, if it keeps popping up that you seem to want to do something besides what you get up in the morning to do every day, then you should run for it. You should go for it. And there are risks. There's always risks. Um, I mean, I, I, I was a faculty member and went back to school and having a bunch of new 20 something friends was certainly interesting. I loved it. Um, some of them are still very good friends of mine, but, but it was a risk that I wasn't going to be able to get a job because I don't practice law. I learned about law and I learned about business, but I'm not a lawyer. I am not a bar registered attorney. Um, what I use that for is to help my clients navigate the legal world. So it's about figuring out, you know, if something keeps jostling you in one direction, maybe you ought to look that way. Mm -hmm. I agree. That, this brings me to, to another question that actually we got from the audience. And uh, Heather, while I have you, I was wondering if you could um, give some input about uh, your experience about having many different interests at the same time. You mentioned that you started in academia and then you went to law school, um, which to to many of us, I think, seems like very uh, different interests. So can you explain a, a little bit about that? Yeah, so bear with me while I explain a little bit about the legal field. Most people, when they think about law, they think about courtrooms and, you know, what they see on TV, or um, maybe they're even watching the Supreme Court on some of the decisions that are coming through right now. But that's not a very large part of law. Most of law is under the auspices of corporate law, which means it's all about how to run a business. And it's contracts mm. and licensing and tech transfer. It's um, regulatory law, working with the FDA, working with the SEC, um, it's defining insider trading versus not insider trading, which is actually in the biotech business, a hard line to define. Um, what's, what is public disclosure that keeps you out of trouble with insider trading and what is not? Uh, for those of you who don't know, Martha Stewart went to jail for insider trading in uh, biotechnology, not in her business. Um, so they actually have a lot. And, and the, the umbrella I work under is my my focus was intellectual property, which is patents and trademarks and copyright and a bunch of other things. Um, a lot of people with science backgrounds go on to who go into law, go into patent law. And that is a very lucrative field. If you like to write science and if you like to work with scientists to help them protect their inventions. Um, I mean, I have friends who make, you know, four or $500 an hour as a patent attorney. I'm not a patent attorney. Um, it's not to my taste, but um, 
it's a really good field and it's all about science. So there's a lot of science in the intellectual property uh, areas of law. So they're not as different as you would think. Um, it's a way to manipulate and maneuver through the, the business of science rather than just doing the experimental side. Right. That's really that's a really interesting perspective because I think that uh, when I was when I was in graduate school, that was never really something that was even thought about. I mean, you you sort of generate intellectual property, of course, and then you find someone to help you with that. It's not something that I really saw for myself as an that's option, me. and it's really interesting. To, it's really exactly. It's really interesting to see that there that there are those people out there. Um, so one other question that we got from the audience has to do with traveling, and I know that. Uh, for in, in many people's careers, traveling is a really important part. So Steve, I know since you've been traveling a lot for your, for your, for your work, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about um, how you feel about sometimes in academia or industry or whatever, needing, needing to travel uh, in order to further your career. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Evan. I, well, number one, I think that's gonna get a lot easier, right? So. Where I am right now, a lot of my neighbors work for Google, Amazon, Facebook, these companies, and they've basically been told that they no longer need to work in the office anymore. So they're gonna be traveling a lot less. And I anticipate the same is true for us in biotech as well. So we're seeing you know, efficiency actually being very, or productivity being very good, doing a lot of meetings on Zoom. But at the same time, you really need to, you know, you need to be getting out there in meeting people quite a bit. Um, over the last year, I've been fortunate enough that I haven't had to travel too much. And I say fortunate because, you know, we have little kids at home, so I want to be able to spend time with them. Um, when you're younger and just starting out in your career, it's a blast, right? You're like, you travel all over the world, you're seeing different things, you're meeting different people, total jet setter. Um, I think as you Get a little bit older you want to settle down a bit with it but um for me <clears throat> i i embraced the travel aspect of it and then when i was working with sailor dynamics international we were purchased by fujifilm so i had the opportunity to go to japan on occasion too which was just great experience and great colleagues there um <clears throat> i think it's a little bit different for everybody right so some people like to be stay home a little bit more and, and not travel as much. But uh, typically what I've seen is that the younger generation or just when you're starting out in your career, people, you know, most people love to travel and be out there. I'm looking forward to all this ending and, and traveling again. I was a little bit, you know, saddened last night <clears throat> at the end of the sessions that, you know, that was the time that you typically meet up with all your colleagues and good to dinner and have a drink and a nice chat about science or life in general. And that's where you really miss out. But yeah, yeah. Um, I think as, as sort of um, not piggybacking, but a sort of adjacent question to this is, is your is the family situation. So uh, we have one audience member who's interested in knowing a little bit about how uh, how you convince your family to move along with you. So I know it's a use. You mentioned that in your first statement. So uh, if you could speak to that, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, it's a difficult uh, question. And of course, it's very, very family dependent because every family is different. And, ev you know, everyone has a spouse uh, that does something that can limit that option or not. Um, when I decided to do a postdoc, first of all, I, I was looking for, first of all, the area, but also I had decided that I wanted to be uh, in California. Uh, and, you know, it's easier to motivate your family when you go to a warm place, of course, moving from Sweden. Um, second of all, uh, my kids were still at the age where they saw this as a challenge and it was a cultural challenge. It was also, a, you know, from a language perspective, a challenge, uh, but also like moving across the world. So I think they were excited and they were still uh, at the age that they were flexible and weren't really missing out um, on a lot from back home here. And we also knew that it was temporary. Um, when it came to my husband, he's a business owner uh, and he could run 
his business from uh, abroad and that also uh, helped us a lot but it's it's very difficult i think you have to pick a, an area where maybe you know depending on whether you have kids or not where you both feel that it will fulfill you somehow and uh, let's say you have a partner that um, also wants to do a postdoc then you could potentially select an area where you both can find uh, somewhere to to pursue that but it is very very family dependent and i don't think there's one right answer for all yeah, no, I don't think so either. And I, th I, I, I agree with that, that it definitely depends, depends on the circumstance, depends on um, the goals of both uh, members of the family or all members of the family. Um, so I, I, I heartily agree. Uh, Steve, did you have something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that because, <clears throat> you know, and I, I'm in complete agreement. And I think, you know, everybody, people have to, really weigh in what their family wants to do too and where that location is and that was a huge decider for me at many different stages and i of course that depends on your goals and for me my primary goal is providing for the my family and keeping them happy secondary to that is health and then so I, you know my career comes after that and career is important because you have to build on it but like having a happy family you're going to be well-rounded you're gonna you know i think to me it's critical for moving forward and, and you can't really sacrifice their happiness for your career goals yeah i yeah that i i think that those are really wise definitely very wise words <laughs> um while we're on the topic of goals um so a lot of us i mean the the point of the session is try to figure out how we're supposed to uh, build goals and things like that and i think that a lot of times people have a good idea of what they want to do, but they might not be as confident that they will succeed. So, um, Daniela, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, some advice that you might give someone um, who sort of knows what they want to do. They ha they they can see the path, but they're not exactly they're not so sure whether or not they'll be able to do it. You know, they're afraid of that failure. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so first up, I'd like to say, and this is again from just very personal experience, that we may currently where we're at, we may think that we know exactly where we want to be, um, but then actually when we get there, <laughs> we realize that that's probably not what we thought it initially was. So I've experienced that. So a few really practical um, things to consider. I realized that when I'm in a place, and that was even when I was in my research lab, I would look around me and look up to people who I thought were at where I'd want to be one day. And that could be, you know, in five years or 10 years. And I'd get to know those people and I would get to ask them about their life and um, inquire about where they're at professionally, emotionally, how they're going, um, and, and then and look at how they got there. And that so I learned from people who I looked at and thought, wow, you really are doing great on in all aspects. But also I learned just as much from people who appeared miserable <laughs> and who, because I, I knew that that's not where I wanted to, to, to get to. Another thing that I did is I traveled a lot, even though I didn't, um, the longest I ever worked away was probably a few months at a time. But uh, uh, going to a different setting, again, taking yourself out of the comfort zone and looking at how things run in different countries, in different labs, that helped me recalibrate my idea of what I think my goals are. And then, uh, again, when you think about, of course, we don't take risks because we are afraid of failure. But when I applied for, and I don't know whether the vocabulary um, applies, whether it's the same between the US or Europe and Australia, but I was 30 years old, so five years ago when I applied for this, um, it's a continuing, which, is, which means a permanent lectureship position in one of the better universities in Australia. Um, and I was pretty much told that it, it's impossible to get. I was the youngest candidate. I had the least teaching experience. 
and um, yeah, it, it was out of forty applicants, um, and I and I got the job. And at the end, I asked them why. How did, why did you give it to me? And they said because you were one of the only people who didn't want to run from research to secure a full time permanent position. <laughs> And you were so genuine about it. You loved research. I didn't want to give my research up. I mean, in Australia, the funding rate is around ten percent, so it's not it's not great, and it's it's only ever falling. So yes, there's a lot of insecurity with with just maintaining a research job. But I think I wasn't afraid of failure because I was so genuine in my aspiration, and I gave it my all. So even if I didn't get the position, I knew that it wasn't my time. It was just going to either I was going to shift focus or it was going to come to me later. So learn from your environment, I would say, to constantly recalibrate your goals and get insight from everything around you on on where it is that you want to get to and, and constantly ask yourself, why do I want to get there? And I think that helps. Sorry, if, if um, does that answer your question, Evan? I think so. I mean, it, it came from the audience, so I, I'll, I'll ask them to ask a follow-up question if, if it didn't answer. Um, but I think that's a, I think that's a great, I think that's a great answer. If, I mean, it, it certainly gave me a lot of insight, even if I, even if I didn't ask the question myself. Um, and it brings up a really interesting topic, one, one major topic, which is mentorship. So you mentioned that you looked at people who were in positions that you thought you could see yourself and sort of um, not compared yourself, but sort of um, use that as a as as a way to inform your goals and to recalibrate and reevaluate how you how you are. So I'd like to ask all of you, uh, maybe starting with Heather, um, it, have there been any mentors along the way that have helped you? And what do you look for in a mentor? What does that really mean? So I think mentoring is one of the most important things that can occur between you know all the different steps of your career. I don't. I, I think that we all get mentored whether we know it or not, but doing a more mm. formal mentoring of, of having a particular person that is designated your mentor is actually a really good idea. And I think that they talking to a mentor, one that's maybe in the field you're in now, maybe finding one that's in the field you think you want to be in and talking to them um, at the, you know, talking to both of them as you make your decisions um, I think is really, really helpful because they can give you feedback and perspective that you hadn't thought about because you haven't gotten there yet. And I think also talking to your colleagues, your friends, your, your lab spouse, we all know what a lab spouse is, right? Um, and, and having that perspective of, you know, should I really go to law school at my age because I'm a little older than 35 and, uh, and so it was it was quite daunting to do but I talked to people who were lawyers I talked to people who were in academia still I talked to people I I was uh, on the NIH uh, Esther review session um, as a reviewer and I talked to people on the grant panels and I just talked to a lot of people. So I think mentoring is really, really important. And then I think you need to turn around and help mentor others as you go along and make your changes so that they can learn to be brave like you are and, and can have some steps they can follow. It's it all, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, absolutely. And I couldn't agree more, um, you know, having a mentor to kind of vent but also to bounce ideas off is very very important whether you're young or even you know come a little bit on the way uh, on your career path um, and this um, because i mean we are uh, we are often experiencing career choices or just important things that happens where you just need an advice from someone who might have experienced something similarly or someone who has a very objective um, suggestion or advice uh, that can provide you with that. Um, and it, it's very important to sometimes talk to someone from outside, not only your lab spouse or someone within the company, but someone from outside uh, and tell them, you know, this is what's going on here now. And uh, what do you think about that? Uh, and, you know, they give you 
um, a reflection that, that might even change the way you think about the situation. Uh, and I think uh, we have daily mentors, as already mentioned, but also, I mean, we have mentors that follow us um, for many, many years, but also that mentor might, you know, not change, but you might add another one, depending on whether you've switched career or you need a different type of input or, uh, so, I mean, it's, it's very, very important uh, to get that feedback. I think so too. Steve, do you want to comment a little bit about mentorship? And I'd like to also add a, a quick question. Um, how do you go about getting a mentor? I mean, we, we mentioned that we sort of are mentored all the time, but if you really wanted to have a, you know, formal mentor, how do you go up to ask someone, hey, can you be my mentor? Like, what do you, what do you <laughs> I guess I just start following them around and then they <laughs> finally <laughs> adopt me. As, <laughs> um, yeah, so it, I like that thought of uh, kind of a dynamic mentor relationship that it changes throughout your life, right? And then usually those relationships stick too. So I've always been very fortunate to have just wonderful mentors everywhere I've been in graduate school, postdoc, early industry, and, and current industry too. And so the and the important thing for me in, in looking for a mentor is somebody that really inspires you, right? So there's, mm -hmm. and that can be in different ways. So like the first, you know, early on in the scientific career with postdoc, you know, it, the Gordon's passion for science and the work of the people in the lab really were inspirational for me. So I wanted to take a lot from that and learn from them, right? And then those relationships d certainly developed and continue over time. And then when I started in industry early on, it wasn't the people that inspired me most in that were actually some of the business leaders, right? So some of the the people on the executive team that I, I realized that I have a, a ton to learn about in a totally different form of science and a way to apply our science. And that's true for both the business development end as well as even the marketing end. I had colleagues that I was trying to pick up, um, you know, skill sets from a marketing and, and ultimately all those relationships and as you broaden your horizons you know hopefully make you more rounded too so i and then your question on what do you look for in the mentor like i said i think it's mostly i think it's just somebody that you can be inspired by and that was actually one of the big career decisions i had at there was a point where i became too comfortable at the company i was at and i i found that i wasn't any longer being inspired by not that I wasn't working with wonderful people that were doing great science, but um, I guess I had tapped it out. So I was, you know, got everything I could from those guys and I wasn't inspired anymore. So then it was time to make a, a change. And that's when I came to mm -hmm. Seattle here to work with Chuck Murray and and now it's sauna. Boy, it's just like we have there's so many different aspects of science and business development at sauna it's like, you know, in, in regard to following people around and glomming onto them and learning from them, it, it, it's limitless, you know, because there's people from the pharmaceutical industry, early drug development, business leadership, everything. And so you, you could, there's a lot of potential mentors there and I just have to, yeah. you know, follow them around and learn from them. I guess, and sometimes yeah. they don't even know that they're my mentor, but I, you know, trying to learn what I can from them nonetheless. But I mean, yeah, that's what we do. I mean, we emulate, we try to figure out what we, what, who we, who, not who we want to be, well, sort of who we want to be for ourselves, but also uh, where we want our careers to sort of, to sort of go and how we want our careers to take shape. Um, but one, emulate one is the exact, yeah, that's, that's perfect, Evan, is emulating, right? So you, you kind of learn those personality traits from different people and hmm. emulate them. Yeah. One yeah. thing, one comment that came that came through um, from the from the audience that I think is is a really interesting interesting point is that as you're moving from different places, moving, so you sort of become the new kid on the block in a way. And um, so, how do you do? You ever do, has it ever felt like you know you've you've 
sacrifice sort of upward mobility by changing by changing career paths or moving to different streams or do you feel like you've as you move from one place to another you're moving mostly laterally um how do you what do you think about what do you think about that go ahead heather yeah you can you can begin so there's a there's a long-standing feeling i think in academia that if you leave academia and the scientific life you kind of didn't um didn't make it right and uh i actually know people who took me off of review panels even though i was still doing science um, and took me off editorial boards because I went. I had the nerve to go to law school for a while before I jumped back into the lab. And I think that you have to just not worry about, you know, whether it's lateral or up, but worry about whether it's where you want to go, and not worry about what other think about other people think about what you're doing, um, because in the end, it it all comes full circle. You know, I still go to conferences and I still mentor students and I still give talks and I still do pretty much all of the same stuff. I just happen to do it in a different forum with a whole bunch of new information. Um, and yet there's still journals that won't let me review for them anymore. Less work. For They're me. lost. They're lost, I say. <laughs> uh, Danielle, I saw you nodding your head, so go, go ahead and comment. Just really quickly, just to echo everything that, that Heather said. Uh, please stop thinking of that path or that trajectory as linear. It's really not. You're not going from A to Z in, in a flat line. It goes up and down. And even if you are moving laterally, it, it really, you're, you're moving to where you need the space that you need to be in and where you'll end up, you'll, you'll surprise yourself because, and I know that I'm using a lot of laugh words and bringing a lot of emotion into this, but I'm truly speaking, if I could give you my story, you'd see that um, that, that I'm truly speaking from my experience and what I've seen around me. So yes, when, as soon as I went into academia, my research lab, which is a really successful research lab, was like, you sold out. <laughs> and now five years later, I'm back in there with my undergraduate students doing PhD projects and we've gone full circle and above and beyond. So it's just, um, yeah, it, it just, just follow your, your pace and, and it's not, it's not linear. Mm. Yeah, it's all you can and go ahead and chime in. Yeah, uh, so I think um, the question is uh, if we're going up or laterally, I think, you know, you're going up education wise. Um, you're learning more. That's definitely up. Um, it's also going up in personal fulfillment. If you made a choice you're happy with, that's also an up. Uh, we're focusing too much on, you know, career wise up while you have to focus on the personal. Uh, it could be even, you know, changing field and being the new kid on the block that fulfills you, then that's definitely an up. Uh, I think uh, also I just want to comment on, you know, switch in discipline. It doesn't necessarily mean that you start all over because what you have in your, you know, bagage with you, you're going to use it in the new discipline and people are going to realize that, okay, why didn't we think of having a chemist in a hospital before? Because, I mean, we have a very different way of thinking, analyzing a scientific question than maybe a traditional molecular biologist does. So I think it's, it's basically you can contribute with the knowledge that you have being the new kid and then becoming meaningful in your new position very, very fast based on the knowledge that you bring with you. And that's at I least the how I experience uh, the changes I've made. And it's always, you know, being interdisciplinary gives you a more central role because you can actually communicate with many, many people within, for example, a company where you have engineers, you have um, chemists, biomaterialists, cell biologists, you have biophysicists, because you, you actually understand a little bit of everything, but at the same time can have the challenging scientific uh, discussions and learn from everyone in the new yeah. field. Yeah, definitely. I think so. I think, I mean, I, I, I just, I know I feel like I, I feel like I'm just saying, I agree, I agree, I agree, but I really do. <laughs> it's really, I think that I, I really am getting a lot. Of, I'm myself personally, I'm getting a lot of really great insight. 
Um, one thing that I want to ask, um, also this is a question that we get, got from the audience, is that when you do have that a little bit more experience from ac academia, how do you know at which at which stage you should end? Well, how do you know, first of all, when you're ready, like when it's time to shift into industry? And how do you know at which uh, stage, at which level um, you should enter at? I mean, we're not all going to enter as maybe senior scientists, um, but maybe we don't want to enter it all the way at the bottom either because we have all of that experience. So how do you, um, how do you prepare for that industry transition? It's about maybe you can continue. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, you can never be prepared and you can never be this, you know, you, you will never be at the point, okay, in one year from now, I've, I'm going to move from academia to industry. You have to follow your heart. And if you are doubting where you're at, talk to people, find mentors, have informational interviews with people who can guide you. I know a, a very, very close friend of mine, and when I was at the Gladstone Institutes, she she had been a postdoc with this amazing lab uh, doing, you know, really breakthrough science. But she had been there as a postdoc for four years, and then she was a staff scientist, and she was considering, you know, I, I don't want to be here in the long run. When is the right time to move informational interviews to ask people for advice and then you need to follow your heart um, for when you are ready to make that move um, and of course uh, people think differently uh, I, I I can just talk for myself when I decided to leave academia I didn't want to burn the bridges <laughs> because i didn't know if if the choice i would regret the choice because it i you know when i started in academia i knew right away you know i i had so much in front of me and it, i was really just on the go uh, but then you know selling came in the way and i i i they were really motivating me with this and you know amazing science that they wanted to create and amazing collaborations all around the world but you know i didn't know whether that was for me uh, so i i decided to communicate with with the professors and the doctors at the Solgransky academy and say you know if i go to selling um, and regret in one year from now can i come back and i mean that's always something you can try and for me it did work so I had a full year of you know open uh, position where I was at any time allowed to come back uh, to academia within that year uh, but uh, I met um, you know the doctor and the professor leading the department you know nine months into that year and he just looked at me and said you're not gonna come back and you know here I am <laughs> <laughs> so I think it, it, it just try if you're if you're hesitant, leave the door open. Don't leave everything behind. Uh, if 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 you are hesitant, leave the door open. But also before making a risky choice, uh, make sure you 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 have uh, enough um, confidence to 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 step into that new uh, risk, so to say. Heather, did you have anything to add? Um, I, I wanted to add something a, a little bit more practical. And that is that there are people who are in their PhDs. They know they want to go right into industry. Um, I've met a lot of people in industry saying, I came straight out of my PhD and they start as a junior scientist or they even start as and they do industrial postdocs. Um, but if you're going into industry to avoid certain things in academia, it, it doesn't really work. And that's because one of the things I hear a lot, because I do a lot of training students how to write papers, because they go into industry thinking, I'm doing this because I don't like to write and I don't want to write papers. Well, guess what? You still have to write papers. You still have to publish your work. And it's, it's even more challenging because you have to do it in the backdrop of the legal considerations, which is to not disclose anything before there's a patent on it. And so it's actually really important that you understand that process. So when you think about, you know, do I want to go straight into industry? Um, it's really, if you come straight out of a PhD, you should do an industrial postdoc in first. Um, 
but also if you do if you do your postdoc in academia you're going to probably come in as a junior scientist if you do a single postdoc and so there are certain steps the problem i found with industry is that sometimes the titles are very confusing uh, i've seen positions advertised here in cambridge for senior scientists that don't need a phd whereas i've seen others that they it's a PhD and they're going to slot you in as a junior scientist. So it's you really have to ask about what the position is before figuring out what level you're going to slot into. Um, but but really, this is just for people who come straight out of academia and their training and going into industry. Yeah, I, I think wanna, that I'd like to add that. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just want to add one thing. It's something that I've heard. Uh, uh, people ask me is, um, you know, okay, so, or people comment or, or say quite often as, oh no, I don't want to stay in academia. I don't want to spend the rest of my life writing grants and chasing money. Uh, guess what? You're going to write grants and you're going to chase money in, in industry as well. Uh, this is, you know, it's a lifestyle and, and, you know, you just need to figure out, you know, where you want to do it. Um, because you're, you're gonna write patents, you're gonna write papers, you're gonna apply for funding, and you're gonna, you know, the whole package. It's not one way or the other. Steve, I think you also had a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on a comment from Heather in regard to titles and the differences between different companies, because that's really important. I see it all the time from applicants that we're interviewing at the at Sano or different companies that I'm at. And the important thing, so they are very different between companies. You might have somebody that's very junior being, you know, vice president, if it's a small company toward to pharmaceutical industry where you see a principal scientist that's a, or even a senior scientist that has, you know, a career worth of work. Um, and I think that the important thing when you're trying to navigate that, because it is so different between companies, is make sure you just learn about the people around you that you're going to be working with and make sure that you see it as a good fit where you're going to end up, right? Because it's going to be, it is just incredibly different. And then the, the second part to follow up on is communication. So make sure you're not running from that communication because in industry, it can even be more challenging because you're communicating not only with scientists around you, but you know, scientists from process development, you're communicating with marketing, business development. There's a lot of different stakeholders in what you do that you need to be able to communicate very clearly with. And so there is a lot of writing and um, presentations for sure. But so make sure you're working on those communication skills because that's gonna benefit you whether you're in academia or in industry. Yeah, it sounds like to summarize, it sounds like what we're talking about is like when it comes to figuring out which part of the uh, sort of where in the hierarchy you you can find yourself, it has a lot to do with just reaching out, finding out who, finding out what it is that people are doing at the specific place that you're trying to trying to be. Um, yeah. Daniela, did you have a comment on that as well? I do. I do. I feel like I have a comment on everything. And also, I just like to say that I am enjoying this panel discussion so much. It's close to 1 a.m. here, and I am wide awake. This is, I'm learning so much from the panelists, and I'm really, really enjoying this. So thank you. Um, so just a couple of, a couple of points. Um, one is on um, communication. So that is, I found that, and this has taken me some time, that to embrace my piece of advice is to embrace your vulnerability. Um, and I know it's scary. I, I suffer from imposter syndrome all the time. I always feel like I am the one who doesn't know what's happening. I am the one that everyone's looking at thinking, what is she doing in this meeting room with the deans and the deputy deans? Um, and it's really, you know, expose your vulnerability and you will find that people will meet you halfway and they will, you know, ask someone to be a mentor who you don't think is, would say yes. And and, and that, that's how you really, that communication really sets up for, for your learning. And the second thing that I wanted to say, and this is related to industry or anywhere else, um, perhaps maybe don't focus on the titles, but look at a place where you can grow. 
Because what you want to do is enter a space where you see immense growth potential. And because that's that, that's your winning, that's your learning, um, as, as we just said. So that, they were my two pieces of advice that I wanted to say on this. I think that those are great pieces of advice. Um, I'd like to hear more pieces of advice, actually. Uh, <laughs> but I'm wondering, so, okay. So now, I can stop oh, go ahead, go ahead. You asked the question uh, before, you asked uh, how do you approach a mentor? And uh, do you mm -hmm. ask them, can you be my mentor? To be honest, why not? Uh, I've had uh, someone come up to me and say, you know what, I would love to have you as my advisor or someone to support me in, in the choices that I make. And, you know, you know, it's actually, it's a, you know, it's an honor to get that question. I don't know. It's that's personal, but I know that people uh, that I've been around, I mean, if, if you have someone, you know, they, they actually like to share, from, you know, their experience and their mentorship. And if they are too busy, they will say no. I mean, what's the, what's, and to be honest, that's the worst that could happen. They're not probably yeah. going to look at you worse. They're not going to, you know, bite your head off. They're probably just going to say, "Sorry, I can't." Um, mm. But when you're looking, so one, so the again, we're the the title of this is finding your fit. So we want to figure out how do we get, how do we reach our goal, how do we set our goals to reach success. And so one thing that I want to ask everybody on the panel is, what do what does success look like to you? Um, how, when you see someone, what do you, um, when do you consider someone to have been successful? What does that mean to you individually? We'll start with uh, Daniela. Oh, I think we lost. Success oh, no, for me left. is really represented. Sorry, Evan, I missed that. You cut out for a, a second, good? but now you're back. Yeah. Okay. Um, so success to me really um, is very closely connected with joy. Yes, we have to go to work and we have to do, I have to do a lot of admin work like grant writing and applications and, and dealing with administration and contracts and, and things that don't bring me joy. But overall, um, I feel that probably over seven, around 70 to 80% of my time at work is joyful for me. And as I said, I have long given up the idea of having a, a work-life balance where I work a set number of hours and don't bring work home. So I have incorporated, I travel with my work. I have, um, are, you, are you guys able to hear me well? You're cutting out a little bit, but yeah. Okay, good. Um, so over the last two years, I have taught um, in um, all over Europe, in India, in the Amazon jungle of Peru. Uh, I've, I've gone uh, with my work, uh, exploring life, learning a lot from life. I've gone and worked as a volunteer in, in medicine camps in some really interesting conditions in Tanzania. And I've just decided that as long as there is that majority of joy and content and growth that I'm achieving through my work, that I'm also applying to my personal life, that is where I should be at. And I'm really looking out for those signs that say, what, when, um, and I think it was Steve who said, when I look around the place and I see the people around me and I see that, that, that there's no way for me to turn and think, oh, that's where I want to go next, then maybe it's time to change. And I'm ready to take those cues in whenever they come. So that is what success looks like to me, fulfillment. And um, accepting that there's going, there are going to be challenges and bits that we don't want to do, but overall the equation shifts towards um, not necessarily happiness, but yeah, content, joy and growth. Hopefully you got all that. Agree. I completely, no, yeah, you came in loud and clear, and I completely agree. Steve, would you like to continue? What does success mean to yeah. who is successful? Sure, and I guess uh, one measure of success is being invited to a career panel. 
But uh, either that or just means you're getting old and have a lot of experience. But <laughs> um, I, I second the notion that success is, is joy. I was about to say happiness, but you know, corrected me on that. So it is joy, though. Like, are you fulfilled in what you're doing? And that's everything from your work environment to where you're living. Is your family happy? Do you have good friends around? Those are all success, right? And so I think my perspective on it changed a lot when I, there was somebody in my team at CDI who was a really, really terrific scientist. And, you know, like I'd, he was doing just absolutely amazing job, hitting the milestones, doing everything right. And I, you know, so I was ready to promote him. And he said to me, like, I, I was just shocked by it. it. I was taken back because I've never met somebody that didn't want to be promoted, but he was very happy what he was doing. <clears throat> and so that was success right there. He's content. He found joy in where he was and he didn't want any more responsibility with it. So it's, mm -hmm. it's where you find that. It's not just hitting some pinnacle in the career. You can have success as a postdoc, as long as you're finding joy in it graduate school, everything. Yeah, I completely agree. Is, that, is everybody sort of in consensus on the joy of success? <laughs> what, do you, what do you think, Heather? What do you think, Heather? So I, I think that success looks different to everybody and that that's one thing we need to stop comparing ourselves to each other because everybody's success is different. So my success included my academic career. It included my legal career. But, you know, it also includes the fact that I all winter I ski every weekend and I have time to train dogs. And, you know, I, I, I do lots of things that aren't work related, even though I work an awful lot. I mean, I love my work. I love what I do. But I think I didn't become successful until I started really being comfortable with the fact that I can turn it off at times and say, you know what, it'll still be there tomorrow. And I'm going to go and have dinner with my son. And I, I do want to make one comment just in case there's anyone in the audience like this. When uh, we were talking about having to move, and you said there's always a spouse. Um, not always. So I did this by myself with my son. And moving a child, I would think, for those of you with kids, is so much harder because a spouse can be reasonable. <laughs> Children, eh, a little harder. <laughs> so I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, I think success is when your family says, you know what, we made the right move, Mom. Yeah, yeah. It's all just let you chime in for the last word and then we'll move on to a different topic. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think uh, we've had uh, three uh, colleagues here who said exactly the same thing that I would like to say. Uh, Joy, <laughs> you have to follow uh, what it is that fulfills you, uh, but also feel uh, that when you wake up in the morning, uh, the workplace you're going to head to is, you know, you're in a hurry to get there. Uh, that, uh, that's a good sign. Uh, of you being in a good place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to. I, I'd like to echo that. I think that as long as you're happy, I think that that's what we're on. That's what we're here to do on the planet. Not to not not to be so too philosophical. Um, but so on your way to success, um, a lot of people have been asking in the questions panel how important collaboration was. So can um, can maybe I don't know who. Daniela, would you like to talk about how important collaboration was in on your way to success? Yeah, um, really important collaboration, and it's not just so. Uh, it's not just you don't meet people and email people and at conferences talk to people just to get to a place. You and Itadel's been everyone's been saying this. It's about you learning, and that's so. Everyone I met, I, I worked in Connecticut for. Um, some time in a stem cell lab um, and, and all over in Italy, all over the, the, the labs in Europe. And those, those collaborations turned into relationships that then shaped all that I am. So um, I learned from them, they learned from me. So please um, reach out to as many people as possible and also give the same back. 
Um, I feel like that has really gotten me to a, a place where, where I'm at today. And even now I'm setting up collaborations with people who are doing something that I'm not even thinking about potentially getting into, but it's great knowing that there is there is an area into, you know, into everything really is, there is no box. <laughs> think outside the box, things outside the square, everything, especially in today's culture and environment, everything's, I could be, and Heather, just you hearing about you studying law and I want to get my master's now in, in psychology, it, it just, I just feel like in 10 years, I'd love to do this in 10 years again to say, where are they now? Because think of your collaborations as your connections to your own future and everything is a gift, every collaboration and relationship that you make through work and anything really. So that's me on that. Heather, I saw you raise your hand if you want to comment a little bit. Yeah, just really briefly, I don't think we actually can do any of this without collaboration. I mean, not just the scientific collaboration, but but the thought process, because I think that um, you, you learn new ways of thinking and new ways of looking at things um, by moving, a, you know, through collaborations. There's a sort of a derogatory sometimes for some people who have made it to Harvard faculty called the 4-H Club. They went to Harvard undergraduate, graduate, postdoc, and faculty, and they've never left. And they've only learned one way to do things and one way to answer questions. Now, there's a lot of really obviously brilliant people there that didn't go through, but but that sort of stigma is there. And it's not just Harvard. Every place has them. That you, you really you learn by your collaborations, not just the science subject, but how to approach questions, how to look at data, and, and really how to maneuver through the process. You, you learn different ways of doing it, and that's one of the things I think is just so important about collaboration. I think so too. I think especially in, in we were talking a little bit about um, today's society, the way things are today, and I mean, now, of course, what's on everybody's mind is COVID-19, this pandemic. And um, so a lot of our audience members have been asking, how have your career goals shifted? How have you reevaluated things in this specific climate with uh, the pandemic and also with the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States? How have these things affected your uh, trajectory? Steve, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. So I, you know, I, I mentioned previously that traveling is certainly much more limited and it's probably going to stay that way for quite a long time. So that's, you know, I guess just getting used to Zoom technology and these type of things. Um, but in, I'm just really, really fortunate with the organization that I'm with right now. So Sana Biotech, they've, you know, they've been incredibly proactive navigating how people can work in the labs um, in a very safe environment and in a situation like COVID. And so they've been, you know, we've been able to maintain momentum while keeping everybody uh, theoretically safe as well. And so I think having, you know, that's something you talked about with collaboration. You've, you've got to have a community around you that that is, is going to take proactive steps to maintain that safety, right? And so that's whether you're in an academic lab and then your whole department will need to adhere to probably new policies, et cetera, or in, in biotech industry where you have to make sure you and your colleagues are all safe and, and, and you know, being diligent about staying healthy in this. And then in regard to the Black Lives Matter movement, um, Boy, it just really makes us, I, for me at least, it makes you very, uh, it gives you a lot of pause for thought and just thinking, what can I do? Where can I contribute and help people? That's it. So, do you have a comment about this? How, how, has, how has the ongoing situation affected your idea of, of, um, of success, of, uh, of goal setting? How does it affect you? Yeah, I mean, uh, at least I can speak for for our company. I mean, we've had to shift focus. Uh, we've been a little bit opportunistic and, you know, find the ways to make sure that we are contributing to, to this situation by maybe shifting uh, the biomaterials um, 
production facility to hand sanitizer and alcohol. So as a company, we've been opportunistic, but career-wise, that's also made me, you know, value every day that I get to be in the lab with the team or, or uh, at the company uh, with the rest of the managers or the rest of the employees. Uh, and you value that much, much more. But of course, uh, as, as we heard, I mean, we are, um, we find, we found out that we can also be much, much more efficient when working from home. So maybe in the future, the future um, position would be combining going to work, but also working from home to keep the efficiency, but also to compensate for the social interaction uh, that you get by being in the office and with the others. So I think it, it's, it's, you know, opened up the mind of how, how you should work, how your daily uh, work should look like. Well, I'm looking at the time now. I want to give everybody else a chance to to answer, but we we are running short on time. So I think I'm going to start with uh, sort of some of my closing remarks. So I just want to um, ask one question to the to the whole panel, and this is sort of about sort of a summary question. Was there a time in throughout your entire career where you um, where there was someone who, I don't know, we often hear people say, you know, someone once told me or a great person once said, and, and so I'm just wondering if there, if you've had any similar experiences within your career that have helped shape the way you think about setting your goals, um, how often you should reevaluate your goals, um, what you think about this dichotomy of success and failure. Um, if we could just go down the line one by one, um, I'd love to hear what you think about that. Some, maybe just a short anecdote. Um, Heather, if you want to start. Uh, sure. This is sort of to go to the example that not all your mentors have to be in your business. You know, when I, when I came back from the basic cell biology meeting um, in 2011, I guess it was, I was looking at all the science and looking at how people had, you know, cured heart failure in mice one more time but never taken it out of the lab, you know, and, and I'd ask the question, well, did you, you know, did you license this out? No, no, we just published the paper and now we're doing another molecule that cures heart failure in mice. And I was at home and I was sort of griping to my teenage son and any, who was teenage at the time and anyone who has teenage sons know they don't really want to hear about it. And so he got really fed up and he said, you know what, I'm so tired of hearing you talk about it. Go do something about it. Go to law school because he's always wanted to go to law school and go to law school, learn about businesses and start doing it yourself. And, you know, I thought that was absolutely insane. That was absolutely an insane thing to do. <laughs> and yet, you know what? He was right. <laughs> so, you know, when people, the, the strangest people can say things to you sometimes that have a huge impact. And so it's, that's why it's really good to listen, even if they're just being exasperated and rolling their eyes at you. Sometimes it's worth it. Yeah, yeah. That's a really, really inspiring story. And now I don't feel bad about <laughs> saying all those things to my mom when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> um, Daniela, do you have a do you have a, an experience that you'd like to share? Um. Uh, uh, yes, lots. But really, maybe I'll just like to share just just my story anecdotally, really briefly. So. I was um, currently at the age of 35. I do, people do consider me really successful with even if you look at it in any which way. However, I was, um, you know, a refugee, came to Australia, born in Croatia, came to Australia at the age of 12, could not speak English until I was 14 and made it all the way to here. And um, one of the, the best thing I heard, I think, and that was quite a few years ago, was to that really we're only, we, we run, humans run on two emotions, love and fear. And we really are limited only by our thoughts. And those are the fear thoughts. And when you're really stuck in a situation, not knowing what to do, just for the fun of it, remove the fear and think about the possibilities. And you'll realize that the fear really isn't real. <laughs> it's just in your head and take that path. So I've done that. That's taken me through some really difficult situations in some really difficult places in the world where the the danger was real 
And because Australia is pretty cushiony in my life right now, it's pretty cushiony. And I know it sounds like, yes, I can talk for this space, but really I've, I've, I've seen a lot, I've experienced a lot, and, and it, it has taken me to this because, you know, I do tend to reevaluate and think, well, no, really, we, we base our limitations on the unknown and we project that fear onto, I can't take that risk because of this failure, but really, what does it mean? You fail, you move on. What's the worst that can happen? So that's, yeah, that, that would be my, my thing that, that someone has said to me that's guided me through life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Steve, what about, what about you? So I, I guess I'll give a little bit of a different example. Um, and it's kind of just like thinking about how one broadens their horizons based on opportunities. And it was something that happened a few years ago and with time, a, a recruiter reached out to me and they were from a food company saying that they were looking for stem cell biologists to help lead this effort. And I was just thinking, what the heck are they talking about? You know, so it turned out it was a, one of these companies making clean meat from pluripotent stem cells or stem cells in general. And I think it just like, so I, you know, I got on the phone just to check it out, see what it was all about. And it really, you know, I see these people in this industry that are just really taking a leap of faith in what they're doing. I mean, here we're talking about the differences between going from academia to industry. And that's really a safe challenge, you know, but when you completely change careers like that to how do you how do you solve agricultural problems in the world by um, applying the technology that we're developing, that really opened up my mind too. And I've met a lot of really interesting people in that field. And so I, I kind of want to put it out there to the to the rest of the audience too. There, there's tons of opportunities for, for scientists and stem cell scientists out there in many different fields. So um, keep that open mind and just listen to what's going on around you. That's great advice. It's at all any, any um... Any anecdote, any story that you'd like to share that really helped shape your your ideologies? I, I have one. Uh, I mean, it's it's a little bit personal, but I'm gonna go ahead. I've never been afraid of sharing personal I really things. It. <laughs> yeah, you know me. <laughs> but uh, it was actually in 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 grad school when when I had one and a half year left. One of my mentors, and um, because you know I I. I had um, gotten my second child during my PhD, which is very common in Sweden that you have children during your PhD. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's uh, basically, you know, considered a position um, and we have great support for those who want to move to Sweden. <laughs> but it, basically uh, I had my second child and I came back and I had, where I worked very hard uh, and I had one and a half, one and a half year left. And one of the mentors, um, you know, one day we, we had a meeting to talk about the, the remaining one and a half year. And she said, oh, how many manuscripts do you have? And I said, I have uh, uh, one in preparation, one submitted and three uh, in the works. And she said, wow, you're gonna finish that in one and a half year? And I said, yeah, of course. And she said, but you have kids or don't you have a, I mean, sometimes what I want to say is you have to not always take the advice from the mentors and, you know, determination gets you, gets you very, very far. And I finished one and a half year later, I had my five, uh, all of the manuscripts uh, were submitted. A few of them were accepted uh, and I got an amazing postdoc stipend that supported me to to pursue my dream uh, postdoc uh, position at the Gladstone Institutes uh, in San Francisco, and and I did that with kids. Guess what? And so I think uh, not always take the advice. Follow your heart, and follow your passion. Just be too determined. Um, you know the stubbornness gets you very far. Um, don't forget to be also humble and realistic. And I think determination gets you very, very far. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Saying that, like, it's good to have a mentor, but you shouldn't take that their word as gold. Your goals are still your own. 
um, you still have to make your own uh, path. I mean, the mentor is there to help you and help guide you, but in the end, your life is your own. Um, I will, so we actually have a few more minutes. Um, I just wanted to, I wanted to make sure that I, that everybody got uh, a chance to, to sort of tell their story, to, to, to give that little bit of, uh, of advice. Um, but one thing, while we're on the topic of mentors, one question that didn't, that uh, I think we should probably address is what do mentors expect from a mentee? Is anybody who wants to begin on that? Yeah, go ahead, Heather. Well, um, I like cookies, but um, what I think really <laughs> we expect is, is, is reasonable discourse, okay? So I do a lot, a lot of mentoring. In fact, I mentor for um, a, a biotech group out here called Mass Connect, uh, Mass Connect which we take small, we take academics who are trying to spin their ideas out in the industry and we put um, mentors in the same room with them for eight straight weeks. And so I've been mentoring in that for about four or five years now. And I would say all but one of the teams, there's three sections a year and all but one of the teams in all those years have, have we've had great wonderful discourse about what they want and where they want to go. And then I had the one team that they were never prepared. They didn't try anything that all 10 of us mentors had suggested. I mean, I understand not listening to your mentor all the time, but once in a while might be a good idea. So, <laughs> you know, I think that the respectful discourse where, where it's back and forth is really important. Danielle, I, th I think I saw you raise your hand. Did you have a comment on that? Yeah, I do just really quickly. As a mentee, I recommend I really appreciate when they come to me with an open mind, a growth mindset, as in this, this is possible, flexibility, and just honesty, and just be genuine in those as, as, as in those discourse moments. When we do have those together moments, be genuine, honest, flexible. Let's grow together. I learn from them as much as they learn from me. Just be, be present and be there with you know with the right intent. And Danielle, this is actually a, a, a question that came in directly for you. Um, uh, how do you keep up with the 40-40-20 academic position, um, maintaining the teaching commitments and the publishing of the papers? It was just a question that came in directly for you. I really that, and think it's yeah. a good question. Uh, I'll be as honest as I've been throughout this whole thing. Um, I It's often that I work at 1 a.m. <laughs> Uh, but and I don't think it's sustainable. I don't think it's healthy. I don't recommend it. Um, it's just that I really do. Um, I really do enjoy what I do. So in terms of my teaching, I create and innovate when I could get away without doing that. Uh, I'm probably more of a 60, 20, 20. So 60 teaching, 20 um, admin and 20 research. But I, I'm, I really am in love with my research and I'm hoping to bring that in. So it's just um, each month, the balance is uh, adjusted. When there are grant time, it's research time. Yeah. Okay. Great and then question. back to the mentors. Steve, um, could you just comment a little bit about what you expect from a mentee? I, yeah, I agree with just the open and honest discourse. You know, if you if you want advice from your mentor, you know, you just you just have to be very honest about what your goals are and what you want, what you value. I think that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So we still have a little bit of time left. I'm, I'm watching the clock like a hawk, so I'm just trying to make sure that we don't <laughs> run over time because there are some questions that are coming in that I know will take a long time to answer. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I want to pose them, but I will. I will ask um, if if um, so. There's a question that came in: is how how important is it uh, to look for job opportunities um, rather than recognize them when they come up? like to actively seek out uh, a job rather than sort of wait for it to to sort of materialize or sort of be created uh, organically wherever you are how aggressive do you think you have to be depends on how much you need a job <laughs> i guess that's a good point <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. but i think um, yeah sure um i think it's important that if you're looking for a job, I mean, the job is not going to 
come after you. Uh, well, for some people it does. Uh, headhunters are very, very active nowadays. Uh, but I think if you're considering a career change, you should definitely find uh, the next step or where you see yourself being successful. Uh, and you should even uh, introduce yourself to, to that or those companies and tell them why you would be beneficial uh, to work for them or what you could add to that. Uh, I know I've done it in the past uh, where I've, you know, when I reached out to the professor in Sweden where I wanted to pursue my academic career, I was the first chemist to start a lab at that department. And, you know, when I spoke to him, he was, you know, you have to create also opportunities for yourself. So go after your dreams and, and you know, they might come true. I think that's a great way to end this discussion. This was really, really great. I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I'd like to thank all of the uh, uh, panelists, all of the audience members. Thank you to the ISSCR for organizing this. And um, I just want to remind everyone that we will be opening our virtual chat lounge. Um, so I will be there chatting, chatting it up in, in the junior investigators forum. And any of our panelists who are interested can also join to continue the conversation. So again, I'd just like to thank everybody here and um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank Bye. you, everyone. It's so lovely to be a part of this with you. Thanks, everybody. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot.